Hello and welcome to Zip Tide. Today, we're making the video that I would have wanted when I was wiring my car. Not totally basics, like you gotta know something about electric, but as far as making a harness and how to hook everything up, this is exactly what I would have needed. So, without further ado, there's a whole lot going on here, so let's get into it. To start the electrical journey, I'm beginning with the battery and all the associated cables. I'm using a lightweight, excess power AGM battery along with two gauge cable to supply the car. Make sure to get good quality cable as it can save you from headaches down the road. I'm placing the battery up front for a better weight distribution. From there, the cable runs to the cutoff switch by the driver, up the firewall, and back to the starter. Rope is a cheap way to mock up cables and harnesses without committing a bunch of time and labor. I ran out of cable to mock fit in the car, so I'm using rope to get the length I'll eventually cut my cable to. Cables are stripped with a sharp knife and when placed in the terminal, you should see a sliver of exposed wire. This ensures that you have the proper depth. To crimp the terminals, I have a lug crimper you hit with a hammer but there are also hydraulic crimpers for the rich and civilized. I don't think it's meant for the connector on the PDM, but it seemed to work, so I'm rolling with it. I like to insulate my battery cables with a dual wall glue lined heat shrink. A heat gun helps a lot and won't burn wires and heat shrinks so easily. Plus, people always steal your lighter anyway. Now the rope gets broken out again. This time it's for visualizing engine and chassis harnesses. Along the way, make sure to label all the sensors and outputs with some blue tape. It's time now to convert it to wire, but what wire should you use? There are three main kinds, Tefzel, TXL, and Junk. Tefzel is the best because it's the thinnest and most heat resistant at a given gauge, so it keeps harnesses thin and flexible. The rub, however, is it isn't cheap. TXL is a great middle ground because it's half the price and nearly as heat resistant and just slightly thicker. Junk is whatever you buy at AutoZone, speaker wire, extension cords, etc. Just stay away. If you buy a flying lead harness from Haltech, it comes with TXL already color coded for you, so you shouldn't need much more wire to complete an entire engine harness. As far as wiring tools, I got by mostly with what you see here. This is a Deutsch crimper tool. It crimps solid pins using Deutsch and bulkhead connectors. This is a generic crimper. It's super useful for open and insulated connectors. These crimpers are designed to crimp OEM style connectors. I got two different ones for more options. And these are super convenient wire strippers. They save tons of time, but they aren't that great at Tefzel wire. But where it really shines is on TXL. And most importantly, a good notebook. Take notes about everything you have to do and have already done. Future you will appreciate it. I planned all my pinouts for connectors, color codes, and designations in mine. For instance, I have it written down, the throttle position sensor needs a five volt supply, a signal ground, and an analog voltage input. And I'm gonna be using AVI-10. There are a variety of different wires, each with their own uses in various sensors and outputs from AVIs, SPIs, DPOs, and more. When planning them out, it's important to remember to allow for future expansion, not just what you have now. The manuals supplied with their ECU help here a lot. You can also find tons of helpful info on Haltech's website for your motor, regardless of what ECU you choose to use. With everything sorted out, I can cap unused wires with a piece of glue lined heat shrink.
I'm passing the wires for the engine harness through a bulkhead connector. A simple grommet is considerably easier to do, but this will make it easier for service in the future. It does, however, add a ton of work now, so take really good notes and do it one wire at a time. Solid pins are crimped by placing the wire and connector in the tool and squeezing it till it releases. The teeth should bite in the middle of the wire side of the pin. I found when inserting the smaller wires in the bulkhead that it was easier to pull it from the other side gently with needle nose pliers. Shielded wires are like wires inside wires. The outer wire absorbs RFI and induced currents and keeps it from interrupting the sensitive snowflake wire inside. Shielded wires can't pass through bulkheads unless if you use this one simple trick. I strip the shielding way back and twist it to a new wire and then cover it with a solder sleeve. When heated, the solder in the joint melts on the wires and shrinks at the same time, allowing for a quick watertight connection. Each wire then gets its own pin and the same process gets done on the other side of the bulkhead. On the female side of the bulkhead, I use installation tools to push the smaller pins in. Plastic tools are cheap and much nicer on wires, but metal ones don't break with repeated use. The fuse box comes with two extra slots which I'm going to use for my starter solenoid and intercooler pump. I already added two DPOs from the ECU to control the low current side of the relay, but I also need to run a wire to it from the battery lug and one going to the load on the high current side. Crimping the pins is done with the OEM style crimpers. It can take some practice, so buy extras ahead of time. On Haltech fuse boxes, make sure you get the correct relays. Your standard part store relay will not fit in the receptacle. Introducing the heat shrink your girl tells you not to worry about. This stuff is crazy and it can shrink down a whole lot. Blue lined heat shrink is pretty terrible at staying on the bulkhead connectors but I will fix that later. It's time to revisit the rope harness I made earlier because it is time it became super useful. I'll stretch it on the table and tape down the ends. I can then set my real harness on top and separate everything out. Next to all the bulkhead connectors, I loop the wire which allows for service and it keeps it flexible. I am not that good at it. To secure and separate the loom, I use captain tape. It is way less bulky than electrical tape and allows for sheathing to slip easily over it. I absolutely love this stuff. The harness is separated with each set of wires ran to its corresponding piece of rope. Injector and coil supplies also get added in. To connect up these wires, I'm using a non-insulated butt connector. They are more bulky than an open barrel terminal, which I admit is the standard, but I could only ever get this single one ever to crimp. They do not like me. 
I will point out though, inside a harness, I would never solder the wires together because it will make them brittle, inflexible, and prone to cracking. And for the haters out there, I promise you these connectors are plenty strong. Now it's time to cover the harness, and I'll be using Raychem DR25. It's a heat shrink that is super flexible and chemical and abrasion resistant. It's different from dual wall because it has no glue and it is far more flexible. It's properly connected to the bulkhead, I'm using a heat shrink boot. These things are awesome, and they come in all shapes and sizes. They are fantastic for strain relieving the connection, they prevent wire and connector damage. At each boot and branching location, I use Resintech RT125 to waterproof and strengthen the area. Dispensers and nozzles are found very cheaply at Amazon. It's important to add a piece of dual wall heat shrink at each branching location if you aren't using boots. And also, I like to add a zip tie for extra strain relief. Here you can really see the difference in stiffness of the heat shrinks. The DR25 is super flexible, but down the line where I use dual wall, it is a lot more stiff, followed by a boot, which might as well be a rock. For that extra little professional touch, I got a heat shrink labeler. It helps prevent confusion in multiple stages, and with a piece of clear heat shrink, it will look good for a long time. OEM style connectors are fairly easy to put together. First, you put the seal on, which hopefully you do before you strip the wire. Then, the wire is placed in the pin and crimped with the OEM style crimpers. The seal is then slid up and crimped with the round crimper. It just needs to grab the seal, but not crush it. The pin is then inserted into the connector and the locking tab is then clicked into place. Adding a piece of heat shrink before you start will make for a clean looking finished product. Wiring in the PDM is much the same process, but with two new types of wires, an 8 amp high current output and a 25 amp high current output. These can control anything from lights and fans to O2 heater circuits. Fans and lights often advertise their current draw, but if they don't, a multimeter set on amps or an amp clamp on a test circuit will tell you. Just be careful not to blow the fuse on the multimeter. The O2 sensor controller communicates the ECU and PDM through a thing called CAN. It's basically two wires that send signals back and forth delivering all sorts of information reducing a whole bunch of wires to just two. In my car, the CAN allows the O2 module, the keypad, the dash, the ECU, and the PDM to all talk to each other. 
I took a supplied can extension wire and shortened it. I also added pins to connect it straight to the bulkhead for a clean install. For the interior of the car, DR25 isn't necessary. And that's where braided sleeve comes in handy. It protects the wire from abrasion, but not dirt and chemicals. It's way cheaper and still looks good. A quick repin of the race pack connector allows me to power it up without any race pack logger. To use a race pack on a Haltech ECU, you either need a Haltech branded dash or one of these fancy CAN interface modules that allow the dash and ECU to talk to each other. While we're up front, I also made a bezel for all my switches, but this will also get zip tied in place for right now. The last thing electrically left to hook up to get the engine to run is the fuel pump. I'm using a four pin DTP Deutsch connector bulkhead to get the job done. The fuel level sending unit is also run through this connector. Okay, for the first time ever, I'm gonna turn on the power. Terrified of sparks, but I think I'm okay. Here we go. Put the light on, on the ECU. Fuel pump turns on. That's cool. All right, so I've done something right. Now, I gotta load the program. The program gets made and loaded via a computer I bought used off of eBay. Haltech offers a variety of base maps with their software to just get your car to run. It will take some time editing to match your harness, but it's super helpful to get you started. Okay, so that is a lot of work. Doing car electrical is incredibly labor intensive. However, it's not that hard. If I can do it as a big dummy, anybody else can too. This thing electrically is ready to start. Hoses, very expensive. They're coming up next, along with a few little things to get this thing to run. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Do it! Just do it! Come true!